whispers through the trees. Bats whisper through the eaves. Your mind's whispers are full of fear, and I whisper in your ear. I am called the Whispering Man, and you're listening to Ghost Story. I don't know anyone who says they like flies. I know people who truly hate them. I know people who tolerate them in a zen kind of way. But I know nobody that truly likes them. And as for me, flies terrify me more than anything in the world. I was traveling through Oregon's Willamette Valley. Portland, my destination, was still over an hour away when I decided to pull off the freeway and take a few back roads. This was through wine country, and it was very peaceful, pretty driving, especially in the spring of the year. Late in the day, as the sun began to set, I came to a small town on the banks of the Willamette River. Right on its main street were several historic buildings, including a grand hotel with a sign indicating that it was 150 years old. That's about as old as it gets in Oregon for anything built by white men. It had a nice brew pub on the ground floor, where I ate a pretty good cheeseburger, along with a beer or three. And by the time I was done, I realized it was really getting dark outside, and I was getting sleepy. The city was 90 minutes away, and I could easily drive that and make my appointment the next morning, so I asked the bartender if the rooms above his brew pub were still a hotel. He said they were, but it was only open seasonally. Memorial Day to Labor Day. I explained my situation, and he eyed me evenly. His face was inscrutable, but he listened, and finally, after considering me for a moment, nodded. I suppose we could put you up for one night, he said, if you don't mind a little dust. Well, that was fine by me. The bartender nodded, traded his bar rag for a ring of keys that was hanging on the hook above the beer taps, and led me up the back stairs. It was like walking into another time. The hallways were ancient, carpeted with threadbare runners, and walled with cracking plaster. For light, he turned an iron knob on the wall, and antique gaslight fixtures flickered to life. I couldn't believe my eyes. Has this place changed since it opened, I asked. The bartender just shrugged. Don't know what it was like when it opened, but we don't fix things that ain't broke. We stopped in front of the first door on the left, and the bartender selected a key from the ring. This room's kept made up all winter case of emergencies, he said. I hope it's okay. The door creaked open. I could just make out the room through the fading sunlight coming in through the curtains. Unlike the hallway, the room looked new. It wouldn't have been out of place in a Ramada or a day's end, and I have to admit, I was relieved. Hope you don't mind little dust, the bartender said again, but I looked around the room and I couldn't see any dust. In fact, it looked like the room had been cleaned that day. I told him the room was fine. He looked at me, almost like he was expecting me to say something else, or maybe he wanted me to say something more, I couldn't be sure. In the end, all he did was nod, tell me he would be available at the night desk, and left. I kicked off my shoes and stretched out on the bed. With a cheeseburger and the beers in me, sleep was coming on quickly. I decided to forego TV or reviewing my papers for the next morning. My head hit the pillow, and I was out. When I woke up, it was dark outside. Even though the street fronting the hotel was a state highway, I couldn't hear any traffic. But I could hear one noise. The sound of a fly buzzing around the room. 
I swear to you, this fly had to be three times normal size because its buzzing was deep and loud. I had the idea I woke up because of the sound, and that seemed impossible. Who wakes up for a house fly unless it's buzzing right in your ear? But there I was, awake in the middle of the night. I lay for a few minutes trying to figure out what to do. And finally I decided I had to kill this thing or I wasn't going to get any sleep at all. I turned on the light and scanned the ceiling to locate him. And the weird thing was I never could. Even after it was all over, I never did see that fly. But I saw something worse. As I searched the room, I noticed that a section of wall just behind the television was different. The walls were finished wood, a rich pine shellacked so that they shined, made of boards that were fitted together, but this one board looked strange. At first I thought it was a stain or a watermark, but then I looked closer and realized the stain was alive. One board, probably four inches wide and three foot long, was covered with an oozing, vibrating mass of flies. I got up and approached them cautiously. They were crawling all over this board and each other, so much so you could hardly see the wood underneath. I stared at them like you'd stare at an animal corpse you'd find on a walk, equal parts fascinating and disgusting. And then I felt those beers from earlier coming up. It was the most disgusting thing I'd ever seen. This one rectangle of wallboard was alive with flies. That, believe it or not, was not the most bizarre thing, though. The most bizarre thing was the sound. There wasn't any. The single, deep-toned fly that had woken me was gone, and the flies that clung to this board made no noise at all. Occasionally one would buzz up a few inches off the board, but it always settled right back down again. They were just crawling over it and over each other, soundlessly. I went to the phone and called the front desk. A machine answered. A message was definitely not good enough, so I put on my shoes and headed downstairs. I found the bartender in the kitchen and demanded another room. I thought you said you didn't mind a little dust, he said. This isn't dust, I replied. This is disgusting. There are hundreds of flies crammed into a tiny space like they were in a box or something. Why would they do that? I'm not going to sleep in a room with that bartender said, I'm sorry, but we don't have any more rooms made up. I dug in, and I argued with him until he finally held up his hands and surrender. Fine, he said. Tell you what, let's go back up together. I'll get the shop back and take care of this. This represented at least some movement on his part, so I agreed. We went upstairs, and he unlocked a utility closet about three doors down from my room. He brought out a shop vac and wheeled it into the room right up to the spot on the wall. It was unchanged. The flies were still climbing all over each other in a writhing mass and still making almost no sound. The bartender seemed completely unfazed by it all. He plugged in the shop vac, fired it up and vacuumed up the flies like it was no big deal. And weirder still, the flies didn't fly away. They just let it happen. Not a single one got away from him. The bartender finished up. He unplugged the shop vac and wrapped up the cord. Then he turned to me a weary expression on his face and he said, Let me ask you again. Do you mind a little dust? And I said, Well, I don't mind a little dust, but nothing as disgusting as that. What would cause them to do that? What would cause them to cluster on one single spot? And he said, Because that's where they found her. What do you mean, her? I asked him. And he looked me right in the eye and said, Do you believe in ghosts? I'll admit at this point, I was beginning to freak out. But something about this guy's attitude pissed me off. 
I didn't want him to know I was anything but angry, so I snapped, of course not. Well, I do, he said. And the thing about the ghost that haunts this hotel is that she doesn't appear as a mist or floating orb of light. She doesn't scare guests with noises or cold spots or any of that crap. She just attracts flies. We stared at each other for a while. Finally, I said, What did you mean before? Before, about, about finding her behind that board. That's where they found her, he repeated. It was around 1900. The man who built this place had just married this socialite from Boston. He was going to get rich with the hotel and she was going to be his queen. Oregon was pretty rough country in those days. This woman was used to the finer things, so the marriage went south quick. She was a terrible nag, and he couldn't do anything right in business. Guy had a nose for a bad investment. Got swindled out of all his money, reduced him and his wife to living in a small room behind the bar. No one knows exactly what happened, but one morning the guy shows up at the train station, looking half crazy, asking for a ticket east. Station master, he didn't like the looks of it, so he calls the sheriff, and at the sight of him the poor guy just breaks down. He confesses it all right there in the train station. They found the bloody axe in the ash pile behind the hotel, and they found her, well, most of her, inside the walls. At that, the bartender turned and looked down at the single board. Most of her right there, right behind there. I looked at him, hoping he didn't hear my heart pounding in my chest. The story had gotten to me but I wasn't going to let him see that. You're going to give me another room, I demanded. You're going to give me another room right now, and I don't care if it's not made up. I'll sleep on the damn floor if I have to. Suit yourself, he said. And he reached into his pocket and took out a key. Now that was funny. He had a key to another room, the room right across the hall as it happens. It was almost like he planned all this. He gave me the key, told me which room it was, asked if I needed help moving my things, I declined, took his shop vac, and left. I went over to the other room, and sure enough, it was empty. No sheets, no toiletries in the bathroom. I went over to the room with the flies to grab the sheets and the comforter off the bed, and as I turned to leave, I happened to glance over at the TV. There was a single fly on that same board. The fly was just sitting there, occasionally walking in a small circle the way flies do. And while I watched, a second fly appeared. Only this one didn't fly in. He came from behind the wall. You couldn't even see a crack between the boards, but he crawled through it just the same. I went over to the new room, closed and locked the door, lay down on the bed and tried to go to sleep. I must have succeeded because at one point I woke up to a sound. It was that big fucker again. The giant deep-toned fly buzz flying somewhere up near the ceiling. I heard it circle a few times. It seemed to be getting closer, and then to my shock it landed right on my nose. I swatted at it instinctively, and to my amazement, I got it. I felt it buzzing around inside of my closed palm, and then without even thinking, I squeezed. I think hearing the squish was actually worse than feeling it. I sat up in bed, holding my hand out to one side. I turned on the light and searched for a tissue or something to wipe my hand off. And as I put both feet on the ground to stand up, another fly flew right into my mouth. I swallowed it. I could hardly help swallowing it. I spit over and over, trying to get the thing out and practically gagging. I ran to the bathroom, washed my hand as best I could without soap, and drank about a gallon of water right from the tap. But it was going to get worse. A lot worse, because I happened to glance up at one corner of the ceiling, and that's when I saw them. There were flies everywhere. 
Up in the corner there was a mass of flies so thick you couldn't see the walls. It was just a black, writhing mass of insect life. And they were flying everywhere, circling my head, flying into my ears, my eyes. There were dozens of them crawling on the bed and on the floor. They landed on my hands, my bare arms. They were crawling on me, crawling all over me. I kept trying to brush them away because I didn't want to swat them and get their guts on my bare chest. But they just kept coming. They could not bite, of course. They were just common houseflies, but I could feel them. Their tiny, hairy feet and cellophane wings, sending every pore they touched into spasms of revulsion. After about five seconds of this, I thought I would go mad. I grabbed my clothes in a bundle. I couldn't even imagine putting them on at this point, because if I did, I'd have hundreds of flies trapped under my clothes. So I threw open the door and started out. And then I stopped. The door to the room across the hall was open. A street light illuminated the room in a jaundiced glow. And there, standing in the center of the room, was a figure about the size and shape of a woman. She was lit from behind so I could not make out her features, but her outline made it appear she was wearing a long dress. And then as I moved closer, I realized the outline I was seeing the edges between the darkness of the figure and the light of the room, these edges were moving. They were writhing, buzzing, alive. And as I watched, the figure seemed to raise one arm and carefully, slowly pointed a finger at the end of that arm. Pointed that finger at me. Right about then, a big truck drove by on the street outside. The flash of its headlamp reflected off the glass of the picture on the wall, and for a split second I had enough light to see who or what she was. Just a flash of light fell upon that outstretched hand, its finger pointed at me accusingly, and I could see, good God, I could not believe it, but I could actually see that the finger, the hand, the arm, the woman appeared to be entirely alive with tiny black insects, just as before they seemed to make no sound but they would not be still. Finger, hand, and arm were all perfectly reticulated and animated, but there was no body. There was no woman. What I saw was made entirely of flies. like hell down the stairs. I ran out the parking lot brushing flies off me as I went. I got in my car and I drove the rest of the way to Portland finding flies hiding in my clothing all the way. I never went back to that hotel. They had my credit card number but no charge ever appeared on my bill. A few months later, on a whim, I did a little research on the place. Apparently, it had closed shortly after my stay. There was one article later on, around Halloween, an article entitled Famous Haunted Houses of Oregon that included an interview with the town's mayor. He said he refused to issue any more permits for anyone to reopen the hotel. He didn't want it to ever open again. Apparently, there was a pest problem. <laughs> 